The following is an interview with Rex Parker, director of the Amateur Astronomers Association of Princeton. It was recorded at his home observatory in the summer of 2020. Tell us a little bit about how long it took you to get set up and what maybe some of the biggest challenges were. In beginning to consider how to get a little bit better at this uh, art or this craft of doing astrophotography and the scientific aspects of it, the technical aspects, the artisan-like aspects of it all sort of come together and it, it was a recognition that the ability to do it at a higher level really required more of a permanent setup and hence the idea of an observatory. And so that idea took many years to blossom. I think it was uh, aspirational, like many of us has, have aspirations of what we're going to do in the future, but it takes a long time to get there. So for me, it certainly took decades to get there. In the period around 2010, 12, I started getting serious about how would one approach building an observatory suitable for the gardens, for the backyard. And we have a place that has all kinds of wildlife and flowers and trees, but also has a very nice open southern sky. So I had the idea of a location not too far from the house, something that needed to be aesthetic and fit into the garden setting. And that really for me meant a roll off roof, wooden style observatory that could build with, be built with a little bit of sort of architectural flair rather than a, a, a dome observatory, which is also a very nice thought, but it didn't quite mesh with the surroundings here. And my wife in particular had some strong opinions to it, and that led to her actually finding a company, Gardensheds.com, which is a, a purveyor, a manufacturer locally, it turns out, of very high-end uh, garden sheds and the like that you find around pool settings and so forth. And as it turned out, the owner of this uh, company lives only about 15 miles from here uh, in Hunterdon County, and I approached him about the prospect of uh, building a roll-off roof observatory based on architectural designs he had already created for some of his other work. I should mention it was my wife who found that garden sheds hit by looking through one of her fine gardening magazines, which is kind of a cute thing. Anyway, one thing led to another. We started getting serious about building plans, drafting plans, and he was an architect. Uh, and this led to uh, the design that we are standing in front of right now. So the idea of a roll-off roof observatory built to specifications to house the instrument of choice on a pedestal of, of required specification and amount of a certain size. And those physical dimensions were a big part of the planning process. Of course, the astronomy side of it, the actual hardware, what the telescope was going to be, what the camera was going to be, what the mount was going to be, were, were serious considerations and all of that. And we can talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute. Now, Rex, you have this beautiful observatory here in your backyard uh, in Titusville. What would you recommend, though, as a starter kit uh, for an astrophotographer? And maybe give us a rough idea of, kind of what, what we're talking about in terms of the magnitude of investment and cost to get started in astrophotography. Well, keeping in mind that the goal is to have fun. I mean, it is scientific, but really, let's face it, this is a hobby. We're trying to get enjoyment and understand at the same time. And so I think that if you have a telescope already, use the telescope that you own, use the mount that you have. Having said that, there's minimal sort of requirements to get this to really work well. So you don't want to go too high here. You want to start with something that's relatively light and relatively simple. So you do need a tracking mount. That's like a fundamental requirement. So it does not need to be a go-to mount. In fact, um, I have inside the observatory here a portable mount that is literally an early 1990s model from Vixen that's sold with a number of Celestron telescopes. It's in great shape, but it's just an old German equatorial mount. And it has a simple clock drive that's geared to the RA axis, so it'll track the sky, but it has no go-to capabilities. It doesn't even have a motor on the other axis, the uh, declination axis. And yet, with the field of view that you can get with a camera, a uh, modest focal length telescope, let's say somewhere between 600 to 900, even a thousand millimeter focal length scope, you can find things uh, adequately with a finder and use a video camera that I'll, I'll suggest a couple, but the types of cameras that we really need are CCD or CMOS cameras that are really designed for astrophotography. And that's not to say you can't use a really nice DSLR that you may be using already for terrestrial purposes. And certainly you can go that route. If you have one, it may, may be the best way to go if you have a really good sensor on them. 
but um, I think that everybody's aware that most terrestrial cameras have filters that really block some of the incoming astronomical light, and you probably don't want to mess around with having it defiltered uh, if you're going to use it for terrestrial stuff. So my recommendation would be go with something lightweight, something relatively modest, like several hundred dollars, not necessarily a thousand dollars. I'm going to show you one that maybe is a little bit on the extreme end of that. This is about a thousand dollar camera. This is a, a Starlight Express camera. Look how small this is. It's really eyepiece size. It's about um, three inches long. I'm going to take the filter off. It has a, an ultraviolet and infrared filter. Just helps with the color balancing a little bit. Maybe you can even see the sensor size inside that. So this goes in the eyepiece holder of your telescope. And with that, a USB connection to a laptop. Uh, doesn't take a super laptop at all, just whatever laptop you're using for your Zoom conferencing probably works here. And the power draw for a camera like this literally runs off of the laptop battery. You don't even need an external power source. Of course, you will need an external battery for your clock drive or your, your tracking mount. So let's say you have a small reflector or a small refractor set up in the field. You've got a finder scope and you've got the finder aligned with the telescope. You can actually find things and get them centered on the camera and start visualizing these things with a type of software that we call, let's call it EAA. We use that term in the club, Electronically Assisted Astronomy. Uh, Starlight Express makes one called Starlight Live. There's another one um, called SharpCap that, uh, that ZWO is making. I think ZWO has come out with some other software, ZWO Capture, and we're, we're finding that you can do video astronomy, not necessarily deep sky uh, captures of images, but rather a form of video astronomy where now the exposure length may be five seconds, maybe six, ten seconds, no longer than that. And you're stacking these images in the software in live, in real time, and it's basically it's a form of video applied to astronomy. I highly recommend this as a way to start because it really breaks you in and you start understanding how cameras work, how the software works, what an image looks like. Not to say that you cannot save those images because you can, and that would be your portal into deciding to go longer in exposure and deeper into the sky, which is what this heavy duty equipment behind me is really designed to do. This little camera, the Starlight Express Ultra Star Color, is a, about $900. There are some equivalent models, and I and a number of uh, members of the club have recently uh, come to appreciate the, the value of this, the latest generation of CMOS sensor-based camera. So you can look this up. I think people are generally aware CCD and CMOS is the nature of the sensor, how it's been designed. CMOS does have some advantages, and I'm finding, for example, the company ZWO Optical and their Chinese company, Starlight Express, is a British company. Uh, certainly there are a lot of other companies that I would highly recommend, but I want to point out that you want to stay lightweight, you want to stay modest in scale, you want the image uh, you want the sensor size to be matched to your optics, which is actually a detailed subject we can talk a little bit more about, but do not make the mistake of buying a, a really large frame, a large sensor, heavy camera that, that creates all sorts of uh, difficulties out in the field when you're trying to balance things and really get your mount to track well. I should mention there are a couple of newer generation tracking mounts that we could recommend here. Uh, Celetron makes something called an AVX mount, which is a German Equatorial. It does a really great job of tracking in a portable tripod setup and relatively easy to polar align that telescope using the software and internal hardware of the scope. Another one is iOptron's um, AZ Mount Pro, which is also something the club has a, a, a version of and some members also on one, the uh, iOptron AZ Mount Pro has the advantage of not requiring polar alignment of any kind. It actually self aligns. It's an alt as style altitude azimuth controlled mount rather than equatorial mount. But for EAA application, for this video astronomy with small uh, cameras, it's working very well to uh, basically track um, accurately enough to allow uh, imaging through this EAA technique. And again, those mounts may be on the order of a little over a thousand. You can actually pick them up used, and I, I should mention a great resource out there, some of you are probably familiar with, and there's, there's other ones, but the one I like very much is Astromart, and it's run by one of the major uh, astronomy stores out on the west coast, I think it's Woodland Hills Camera. But Astromart is the online swapping shopping place for used astronomy equipment, and it has a long history, it has a very secure platform. I've had great 
success moving and acquiring uh, high quality used equipment through Astromar. There's no reason to necessarily pay top dollar for any of the hardware here in my hand, around me here, although much of it was new, much of it was also used. And uh, I think astronomer, amateur astronomers have a pretty high code of ethics in terms of uh, reselling uh, used equipment on, on Astromar. I, I would recommend you take a look at that. Rex, you mentioned the uh, ZWO series of cameras. There's a broad array of cameras and options available. And you mentioned matching your camera to your scope and weight and sensor size and the like. Um, can you maybe tell us a, a little bit more about how one decides on how to match up scope with the camera? Yeah, well, there's a lot to consider there. And it is a little difficult to confront all the details of it. It's, difficult to uh, talk about it, in fact, without having charts and diagrams in front of you. But, for example, this little camera, which I said costs about, I need to put this down, <laughs> sorry, costs about $1,000, um, maybe a little bit less. You can maybe get it for $750 on, on Astromart. You see the size of that sensor. It's about 10 centimeters by, maybe even less than that, 9 centimeters by 13 centimeters. The pixel size is something like 6 micrometers. And both of those points are what you want to pay attention to. The size of the pixel, the, the, basically the micrometer uh, dimensions of the pixels, the number of pixels, but really more than the number of pixels, the, the, the full frame size of the sensor, the literally the physical uh, X and Y dimensions of the sensor and matching that size to the illuminated circle that's coming through your telescope optics. So when you have a relatively short focal length scope, like a 600, 800, thousand millimeter refractor, maybe a five inch reflector, you're going to have an illuminated circle on the order of about maybe 15 millimeters in diameter. And as you go out beyond that, what you'll find is a, a, an optical property of vignetting where the light intensity falls off. Further, you have certain types of uh, aberrations due to the optics. Depending on the quality of the optical design, you can have types of aberrations, basically curvature of the field. And field curvature means that some of the stars are going to be oblong or out of focus, or you'll have coma. You'll have a variety of optical defects. The larger the sensor, the more you're picking those up because they lie off of the central axis. So if you keep your sensor small enough that it's mostly on the central axis of the telescope, then those effects are going to be minimized. You're going to be a lot happier result. You're going to be a lot happier with your result. Um, at the same time, the smaller the sensor, the, the, the narrower the field of view, and the harder it is to put an object onto it when you're moving the telescope around the sky. Those two things sort of balance each other out. Um, and I think that if you buy a camera with the dimensions something like 9 by 14, 10 by 15, not much larger than that, you're going to be happier as an entry level or even your second camera. Uh, you don't really need to go bigger than that until you get up to an optical system like we have inside here. Pixel size is an important consideration, but really th there's some limits on what are even available just because of CCD and CMOS technology. You see some cameras with the, the pixels are as small as three and a half micrometers. Um, I personally stay away from those. They, they tend to have a less of a dynamic response because those tiny wells fill up with photons faster, if you will. Their full well capacity is less. If you're in the neighborhood of five to six micrometer uh, uh, dimension pixels, then you're going to have a greater well depth, and that's going to give the camera better dynamic range. Uh, we could talk about in a minute some other aspects like the full color uh, sensor versus the RGB filter method. That's sort of another, another level of, of discussion here. I guess with uh, observatory and with astronomers, you're never really done when you're uh, with all your gear. Um, there's always something else maybe on the <laughs> on the list that you'd love to pick up. What what gear are you considering adding to to your observatory, and, and and what would they add to your to your interest? Well, this will sound funny, but I'm probably where I need to be. I'm at a sweet spot, so I'm really spending my time utilizing the equipment I have, and I think I can go many many years with the hardware I have. Having said that, I did just upgrade a camera just last summer. I bought a new CMOS color APS-C size uh, camera, a ZWO brand. Some of you are familiar with that. And this, is a, this has been a, a great advance for me in terms of how well it meshes with the sky conditions we have here in New Jersey. 
so I really think that other than portable stuff, uh, things for outreach, um, small scopes and small tripods, uh, some of which are standing behind me inside the door here, uh, those might be in the future, but really at this level, um, I have what I need to equip this place. That's not to say that um, one can't go deeper and higher. And To do that, my ambition has been to go outside, and I've had some experiences at some, uh, some professional observatories I've, I've been fortunate enough to get access to in Chile as well as in Mount Lemmon, Arizona. We could also talk about later. But I think, um, you yeah, know, we're set here. We're, we're in good shape here. And now it's all about finding the time to utilize the equipment that we have. I will add that uh, Rex said that without his wife observing his comments, <laughs> so he must be true. So let's, you mentioned a little bit earlier in our interview about um, some other places you've shot. Can you maybe tell us uh, some of the highlights of those experiences, perhaps Mount Lemmon, uh, and any places that you recommend to uh, amateur enthusiasts well? As you well? May, some of you may be aware there are these horrible forest fires down at Mount Lemmon in the Tucson area right now, and, it's, and it's, I really shuddered when I've seen some of these images online just the last couple of days because that's exactly where the Mount Lemmon Sky Center sits on the top of... Mount Lemmon, just to the north side of Tucson. And I've been there several times, uh, most recently this summer, a, an excursion with my wife and some friends to do visual astronomy. But I actually, I have to give credit to Adam Block, who's a well-known name, sort of a guru in the field of amateur astrophotography, how to do it and how the software meshes with the hardware, and in, in particular, the image processing side of it. So I actually went to Mount Lemmon uh, for advanced imaging workshops twice in the gosh, maybe seven years ago, and then I got about five years ago and took a multi-day course where he actually resided on the, at the dorms on the top of Mount Lemmon and worked in the observatory with Adam for uh, several days in a row. And really, it just took me from up down here to really this level and, and changed it for me forever, really, because I, I figured some things out. He showed me how to do some things that I hadn't been aware of in terms of image processing and reduction of noise. So that's gone really a long way to allow me to apply those uh, learnings in my own setting here. Uh, similarly, I've been very fortunate to get access to a great telescope up on the top of Cerro Tololo at the CTIO, the Cerro Tololo Inter American Observatory down in Chile in the Andes at about 9,500 feet. And here I was fortunate to uh, have made, um, I guess I could say make friends with a really well-known astrophotographer Steve Maslin who lives over in Bucks County. We actually had him into the club for a presentation several years ago and having brought him in and hosted him for that evening sort of led to another and a few years after that he approached me about they had a slot in their imaging group and so I joined a group of four or five guys who for let's just say a, a, a considerable sum of money <laughs> coin of the realm gets you access in this case to an academically owned uh, observatory telescope, part of a project that's being run by um, Dr. Uh, um, Dan Reichert of the Department of Astronomy and Physics at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, and I actually went down to visit Dan at his uh, at his place in the uh, planetarium offices on the campus, beautiful campus too. If you've been down there, but they run a remote operation, and they've been the champions of something called Skynet. Skynet is a collection of telescopes all over the world, so it includes the cluster on CTIO. So back to the point, I, my group, Steve Maslin's group, we, we call it Star Shadows Remote Observatory, and we have access to a 16-inch RC telescope inside a dome up on uh, the, the mountain at Cerro Tololo. And we have basically half time access for the fees that we're, we're spending for it. So basically it's an annual contract. We get the dark half of the lunar cycle. So we get one week before through one week after the moon, new moon every month. Having said that, sadly, like every other operation around the world right now, it is shut down entirely because of the COVID situation. So we have not been able to access data since early March. But uh, that's, that's been a significant part of the learning curve because now we're talking about a really, really high-end camera, a full-frame type CCD with, uh, with a RGB filtering and, and also hydrogen alpha and oxygen three and so forth. So there's a lot of capabilities at that level. That telescope, interestingly enough, was built for a project having to do with seeking the optical counterpart of gamma ray bursters, the uh, 
enigmatic gamma ray bursts that occur all over outside of our galaxy. And so after running that project for many years, um, basically it became available for other things. And I think Dr. Reichert realized this was a good way to help supplement their research budget by, uh, if you will, farming out the scope to amateurs like us. So that's been, that's been a, great, a great experience for me in terms of the learning curve and also figuring out how to manipulate really large images and really deep images where we'll go, we'll literally go 50 hours, 60 hours on a single object, split into four filters, RGB and luminance, of course, but maybe 20 hours of luminance and typical subframes of 30 minutes. So you can imagine the data that's coming in. It, it is a bit like drinking from the fire hose there. Well, there are a lot of uh, cool things going on inside the observatory here. When you look around, there's a lot of hardware. There's a lot of, uh, looks like high-end equipment, certainly it is. I would mention at the beginning, almost everything in here was made in America. How about that? I would say that I, I did keep that in mind when I was acquiring equipment, but nonetheless, um, the pedestal is made by a craftsman out in Pasadena, California, Advanced Telescope Systems. This is a made-to-custom order aluminum cast pedestal that's sitting on a concrete uh, pedestal that goes down into the ground uh, three feet to vibration isolate the observatory from the scope. Sitting on top is an S-Big MX, Paramount MX mount. Uh, the MX is the littler brother of the MEs that we have out at the AAAP Washington Crossing Observatory. It has a capacity of about 90 pounds payload, and you can see with the, uh, with the counterweights on the end here, there's about 70 pounds of counterweight, so I'm somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 pounds on the business end over here. The telescope is a semi-custom design made by AG Optical, which is out of Huntsville, Alabama, and a craftsman down there started making really fine optical instruments about 10, 12 years ago. Now the design of this telescope, it is a Cassegrain reflector, 12 and a half inch mirror. Uh, F ratio is F6.7, so that's a pretty fast scope for a, for a 12 inch reflector. It has what they call modified Dahl Kirkham design, which is a type of Cassegrain where there's glass elements in the optical train before the light comes out here that correct the figure of the optical path, so it makes an exceedingly flat field. This telescope is capable of illuminating a full frame CCD or a 35 millimeter film size frame, which is quite an accomplishment. Uh, some of you have probably heard of Plane Wave, which was a company out in California spun off from some Celestron engineers. They're making a similar design. So this scope is very much like a Plane Wave design, modified Dahl Kirkham. So the light from the distant galaxy coming through the scope emerging on the side where our imaging train exists I've had a lot of different configurations here. I'll talk about this one in a second, but formerly, for many, many years, I've used an S-Big CCD camera. This is really was one of the most famous cameras, still is one of the best cameras. They use the sensor in this, which is a KAF 3200 CCD, has the highest quantum efficiency of any chip even to this day, a monochrome sensor, which therefore requires in front of the sensor itself part of the camera it's actually attached as if it were one unit but there is a filter wheel in here that allows the location or the movement of red green blue hydrogen alpha oxygen 3 uh, transparent filters for your luminance frame so you can do RGB imaging and in that technique you take images of an astronomical object for whatever decide whatever your length of frame is you're going to repeat that multiple times with each filter finally creating an assembly of data files that you're going to recombine in software to make an RGB or an L for luminance, LRGB uh, image. Now I've found that for really high quality sky situations like down in Chile or Mount Lemmon, this type of a camera is by far the best way to go. There are a lot of reasons for that, but in the situation we have here in New Jersey and the East Coast, Let's face it, we're dealing with a lot of light pollution. We're dealing with gradients of light in the sky, sometime enhanced by the moon, made worse by clouds, certainly made worse by Trenton's lights in Philadelphia and New York. And that means that you don't have the, um, si the same situation. You don't have the ability to assemble 
you, you don't have the ability to acquire the lengthy frames that doing RGB imaging may need. Furthermore, color balancing and getting rid of gradients from each of those different color filters can be very, very challenging. Not that it can't be done. I spent years doing this, but I found an easier solution. And this is one that I recommend to club members to think about going in this direction. So sitting here is a color CMOS camera sometimes called a one-shot color, but really it's the same technology that exists in your DSLR cameras or really little handheld, tiny little cameras, cell phone cameras. Same technology, but with a sensor and electronic controls designed for astronomical application. So again, you can use your DSLR, get the right bracket to connect it to the, to the imaging train here, and you'll do just fine with it, but I prefer to go with something that has cooling. And cooling does make a difference in suppressing the dark current source of noise that a sensor will pick up and the longer you go you basically over seconds over minutes of time of accumulating any single frame you're also accumulating dark current noise you're also accumulating noise from the sky background you're accumulating that background blanket of light it turns out that the longer you go in your exposure the more you become limited by the background ambient sky glow so when all get when all is put together, if you're trying to go deep, there's going to be a length of time which you probably don't want to go longer. For me, with this setup, I do 12, typically, 12 minute frames with this one-shot color camera. An APS-C size sensor, which a lot of the sort of intermediate level cameras are using. A relatively large sensor, much like twice as large, three times as large as the ones we were talking about before with the little Starlight Express camera. But this telescope is designed to give a flat, perfect field on that large of a sensor, so it works out very well. I will typically acquire 12 or 15, maybe even 20, but probably not more than that. 12-minute uh, subframes with this camera on, let's say, a galaxy or a nebula that are in the sky most seasons of the year. T pick your favorite target and go with it, and you'll find that you've got enough signal and you've minimized minimize the noise contribution as much as you can to probably reach an optical, uh, sorry, an opti optimal uh, final image. So again, about maybe 12 to 20 12-minute subframes, so you're talking two to three hours of total data, not necessarily more than that, and I'm reaching a level of quality in the images that I can reach pretty similar as going maybe 15 hours with the CCD RGB method. There are limits, and it's never going to be as good as Chile, but hey, it's pretty good for the New Jersey skies using this equipment. So I have to say, uh, this is the way to go, whether you have a big scope or a little scope, having a one-shot color Given the circumstances we have with our skies, I think you're going to achieve much better results. That doesn't mean that there aren't some tricks that you need to learn with the software to eliminate those noise elements that are built into your data. When you get the image frames, you're going to look at them, and your first glance is you're going to go, oh, wow, what am I doing wrong? But no, each image frame belies the wealth of details there if you can learn the techniques of eliminating the sources of noise and combining the images and aligning them properly using software to create that final mean image. Okay, so you may be wondering what are all these cables dangling around and how do you how do you work your way through this sort of maze of spaghetti? Well, a couple of these cables are here as extra cables to allow me to rapidly connect the second camera if I want to swap it out. So don't worry about these. Some of these cables are controlling the telescope. It has some advanced features for dew control and mirror temperature control. It has built-in heaters and a built-in fan, and these are part of that sensing apparatus and control mechanism. That's up here. These cables, uh, the, the camera itself, as well as the little Starlight Expresses, and really all the modern cameras on the market today, are working through USB connections to your computer. In this case, I have a USB 3 cable going to a, a PC desktop computer, believe it or not, running Windows 8. I still run Windows 8, and it handles it just fine, running the control software. A guide camera over in the back side, you may not be able to see it, but there's a second small telescope in the back, which is a, a refractor used for auto-guiding, which is another layer of control, so you can really track in the sky accurately. And again, the USB cables going through, some of the cables are going through the mount just to minimize the mess and coming to the computer over here. Now, the software aspect of it is a very important mating. You want to match your software to your hardware. Uh, there's a number of things out there, and what I'm using is the Sky 10, the same program that the club uses out at the Washington Crossing setup. 
The Sky 10 has a lot of capabilities. We only use half of it out there, in fact. It has the ability to control cameras as well as be a planetarium program and control the scopes, motion, and slewing to objects in the sky. I uh, also use Maxim DL, which is a very, let's say, a, an honorable program that goes way back and has been through a lot of evolution of the very field of amateur astronomy itself. Um, the company that owns Maxim, Diffraction Limited, in fact, now owns SBIG, the maker of this other camera that I was showing, and a number of you have heard of it. It's actually a famous name in astronomy now. I recommend Maxim DL as well for scope control and camera control as well as for processing. So regardless of exactly which software you're using to get the data, and I should say if you're using EAA, if you're doing the video technique, you're really just using Starlight Live or SharpCap or ZWO Capture software to do the imaging. You may save those images to your disk even whilst you're doing video astronomy, save a few frames to your disk and go back and process them later. So this idea of post-processing requires another layer of software. Some of it can be done in the, in the software we just mentioned. These software programs have a lot of capability. If you get really serious about it, you're going to want to you're going to want something that is able to really process the raw frames in a really facile manner because you're going to start dealing with more and more image subframes and the requirements are going to get a little bit harder. A lot of stuff out there. I'll just tell you what I'm using. CCD Stack is a, a software made by um, CCD Ware Company. Very cleverly designed, excellent program. CCD Stack to take the raw images, calibrate them by removing the dark signal and the um, the bias framed, and I haven't talked about flat framing, but another ele another aspect of the, let's say, the noise in your system can be taken out by flat framing, and these software packages allow you to remove that from the data that you've stored on your computer, the image, image subframes that you captured during your session. CCD Stack, Maxim DL, um, even the Sky 10 can do this, and you really want to invest in software. It's not necessarily uh, cheap, I mean several hundred dollars, not necessarily thousands, but you don't want to skimp on this because it's a very important element of what you're trying to achieve. Once you get to that point, and certainly we can talk later in more detail about how you reach that point, you may want to go to a final level of, let's say, perfecting your image by using something like Photoshop, which is what I actually use for the later stages of image processing, color balancing, enhancing the saturation of the color, things like this. This has been an interview with Rex Parker, director of the Amateur Astronomers Association of Princeton and produced by member Rich Sherman. Founded in 1962, the Amateur Astronomers Association of Princeton is a nonprofit organization that promotes a wide range of astronomy related activities, including solar, planetary, and deep sky observing, astrophotography, star parties, lectures, and education. The group owns and operates its observatory at Washington Crossing State Park in New Jersey. For more information about the club and its outreach activities, please visit www.princetonastronomy.org.